Well, I just want to read, uh, first of all, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, we're still looking at the idea of God forming and then God filling what he forms, he then He then fills. So that's still what we have in, in mind. Uh, we looked at that way back at the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 in relation to creation and the earth without form and void. And then God forms something and what he forms, he fills. And so last week we looked at the idea of the formation of man uh, in Genesis chapter 2 and how that he formed man and then he breathed into man. And we thought as well even of the compilation of Scripture uh, how that he, that God just brings together words and phrases and paragraphs and and verses and chapters and He breathes into it and it becomes a, a living word. It's filled with the very breath of God. But this afternoon we're going to look and we looked at the incarnation last week as well, and uh, we looked at how God brought forth uh, His Son and uh, how that He was He was uh, that God had. Uh, had overshadowed Mary and that the Holy Spirit had come upon Mary. And we saw the work of the Holy Spirit, whether it was in creation or whether it was in the formation of man, God breathing uh, into man's nostrils the breath of life, or so whether it was in the relation to the compilation of Scripture or the incarnation of Christ. We see the work, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at the idea of the regeneration of the sinner uh, and then we're going to look at the uh, institution of the church. And then we'll also look at the idea of the restoration of Israel. And in each of these events, we'll notice that the work of the Holy Spirit is absolutely, utterly essential. So let's look at the end of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, uh, or verse number 17. Uh, we read, Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, just down uh, chapter 4, and uh, we'll just go down a wee bit in chapter 4. Verse number, verse number three says, If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, uh, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And he goes on and says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. So there we have a, a little description of the work of God in the human heart, the work of God in the regeneration of a sinner, the work of God in salvation. You know, we've looked in these various passages uh, last week and the, the previous occasion when we spoke about forming and filling, we thought of the material that God had to work with. You know, normally craftsmen want to work in the best material that they can get. Uh, you know, I, I remember many, many years ago um, in a different life, um, I, I was involved in selling high quality uh, boardroom and office furniture. Uh, you know, some of the manufacturers that we were buying from would have sent representatives all over the world looking for the best possible veneers for their furniture. They were, wanting, they, were, they were building something of beauty and something of tremendous worth. And so they wanted to make sure that the materials they were using was the best that they could get their hands on. 
But, you know, it's interesting that when God works, the greatest artist, the greatest artisan, the greatest potter, the greatest sculptor that has ever been, God doesn't use the best of materials. He uses the worst of materials. <laughs> you know, the earth was without form and void. Then he creates a man from the dust of the ground. We mentioned that, you know, we're not created from, a, we're not formed from diamonds, but we're, we're formed from dust. And when God does the work of regeneration, uh, he regenerates the lives of men that are broken and weak and guilty and, and, and sinful in his sight. You know, we think of the, the world of humanity that is round about us, that we are part of. It's sinful humanity, it's fallen humanity, it's corrupt humanity. Uh, in the opening verses of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul reminds the Ephesian Christians what they once were. He says, you know, you were dead and, and you, were, you were disobedient and, and you were at a distance from God and, and you're in darkness. And, and that's all we see in the humanity around us. And yet God is able to work with that kind of material. <laughs> Not the best of material, but the worst of material. And God is able to form something. And God is able to bring something forth for his glory when he forms it and then he fills it. You know, it is good just to remind our hearts of where we came from. I know we talked last week about the fact that ultimately we, we trace ourselves right back to Adam and we trace ourselves to the dust. But, you know, the humanity that we're, we're part of, the human race, in spite of all the educational advancements and the technological advancements. Your man at his very root, his very nature is depraved. He's sinful. He's full of darkness. And yet the wonderful truth is that God, the very God that commanded the light to shine out of darkness, is the God that is able to shine light into darkened hearts of sinners. You know, glad for that moment when God said over your life, let there be light, let there be light. You know, the sovereign work of God in a soul. A man, a woman, a child in darkness, morally, spiritually, facing eternal darkness, <laughs> blind. And God speaks. Let there be light. And just as surely as light came forth from the presence of God and filled the scene in Genesis 1, verse number 3, even so that same light shone into our darkened hearts, lifted the scales from our blinded eyes, and we could see, we could see, delivered from the power of darkness, and translated into the kingdom of the son of his love, delivered from darkness into light and a word and a work of God. It's interesting, isn't it? When, when Paul speaks about, about conversion, when he speaks about regeneration in, in 2 Corinthians 4, he, he takes us right back to creation, doesn't he? <laughs> God commanding light to shine. And then he speaks about this treasure that, that God places. And where does he place the treasure? The treasure of the knowledge of his glory. He places it in earthen vessels. <laughs> he doesn't place it in a silver vessel, a golden vessel. You know, a diamond encrusted vase. <laughs> but he places it in vessels of dust so that the excellency of the power of it all might be of him and not of man. And isn't it wonderful just to think that, although we are just but dust, we are just earthen vessels, <laughs> that God has not only worked in our hearts and formed and fashioned our hearts, but he's filled them. He's filled them. It's interesting as we go down through uh, chapter 4, what he has filled us with. He's filled us with truth. 
Look at what we read in verse number two. It says, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So one of the things that God has filled us with and what should be manifest in our life is truth. And of course, we remember the words of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 14 and verse 6, where he says, I am the truth. I am the truth. I am the truth. Notice he, he'll say in verses 4 and 6, as we have already alluded to, in verse 4 he says about the light of the glorious gospel shining unto us. Verse 6, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So God has not only filled us but with, with, with truth, but he's filled us with light. These earthen vessels, these pots of dust, filled, filled with truth, filled with light. And the Lord Jesus can say, I am, I am the light. I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. But notice he tells us, as we've already alluded to in verse number seven, he says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What is this treasure? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. We think of that which was manifest in the life of Christ. He that has seen me has seen the Father, he says. We beheld his glory, says, the, says John in chapter 1. The knowledge of the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus, that's the treasure. And that treasure has been put in earthen vessels. You and I have been taken, taken from the dust, as it were, taken from the dunghill, taken from darkness, taken from a state of death. And God has worked upon us by his spirit. And he's shown light and he's shown truth and he's shown glory into our hearts. And he's made us all together different from what we were. And he's made us all together different from the mass of humanity around us, that we have something within us. John say, Paul says again in verse 10, he says that he bears about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. And so what God has done, what God has filled us with, he's filled us with Christ who is the light, who is the life, who is the truth, in whose face the glory of God shines. And that blessed one is the one that fills these, these vessels of clay. You know, just to grasp that this happened, that we are part of God's wonderful, glorious, eternal new creation. You know, everything we see around us, the wonders of creation, physical, material creation, it's got an end point. It's all going to be terminated someday. It's all going to be dissolved. But the work that God has done in your heart and mine is a work that will last forever. It will last forever. We are part of this glorious, eternal, new creation of God. A new society. A new community. Community. Something in the world that has never been there before. And we're part of that. And God has worked in our hearts as individuals. These earthen vessels. And he's fashioned them. And he's formed them. And he's filled them. He's filled them. There's just one wee thing I want to underline before I believe that. And it's just this glorious truth that Christ lives in us. Christ lives in us. 
Every one of us. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, then Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you. The same Christ that was here enough for 30, 33 and a half years ago that we were remembering this morning. And we traced a little of his life this morning, his character, his Christian graces, his godliness. He lives in me. He lives in you. I want you just to ponder that. Because that truth can revolutionize your life. That's the secret to Christianity. It's living in the good of the reality of an indwelling Christ. I learned the lesson a long while ago that there's only one person that can live the Christian life. And that's Christ himself. And you and I trying to be good Christians <laughs> would only result in a very faint, broken facsimile of the real thing. Christianity is not about us trying to live like Christ. Christianity is about Christ, the Christ that has been placed within us, the one that is truth, the one that is light, the one that is life. The one in whose face the glory of God shines. That same blessed one lives in us. And wants to live through us. So that all these spiritual graces we spoke about this morning. That they might be seen in our lives. Christ living in me. Glorious truth. But, you know, what we learn as well in relation to the life of the believer, you know, there's not only our salvation or regeneration, but, you know, there's the process of our sanctification. Your salvation is an instantaneous thing. Just like creation was an instantaneous thing. God speaks and it's done. But, you know, there was the whole fashioning and forming of it all. After God had commanded the light to shine, there was a process. And salvation happens the moment light shines into our hearts and we believe. But then there's the process of sanctification. There's the process of God working in our lives, fastening and forming us into the image of his son. So that it is no longer I, but it is him living in us. And think of the words of Paul as he writes to the Galatians in chapter 4 and verse 19. You know, he says, he says, I travel again, travel again in order that Christ may be formed in you. Christ may be formed in you. So all the features of the life of Christ manifest in us. Paul says, that's, that's the burden of my ministry. That's what I taught when I was among you. That's what I'm teaching by my letters. That's the burden of my heart that Christ is a labor as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a as a mother about to give birth, a labor, a travel, so that Christ is formed in you. Paul wasn't interested in people being conformed to some system of beliefs. or some system of doing church or anything, Paul says, my big burden is just to see Christ formed in the people of God. You know that that might be our burdens, just to see Christ formed in each of our lives. You know, we notice as we go through the New Testament that, you know, there's a process of filling. Paul prays, Paul prays time and again that the believers might be filled, that they might be filled. You know, sometimes I suppose even in a Christian life, it's just a kind of form of things, isn't it? You know, it just can become pretty routine then. And you know, it's almost like a kind of 
coat that we put on, a, uh, a costume that we put on at certain times and for certain occasions. And there needs to be that process of sanctification, that forming and that constant filling. You know, Paul speaks to the Colossians in chapter 1 and verse 9 and he talks about being, being filled with the knowledge of God's will. Filled. You know, the ungodly knows nothing of the will of God. But you and I have the capacity to be filled with the knowledge of God's will and to walk in it and to fulfill God's will for our lives, God's, God's purpose. God's big purpose for all of our lives is holiness. <laughs> this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You're being set apart in holiness for God. But God wants us to be filled with his, the knowledge of his will. That path that he has for our life, and for us to yield to that. You know, we thought about the garden this morning. But the Lord Jesus says, Father, not my, not my will, but, but yours be done. And young folks, older folks, that's the point that God wants to bring you to. To that point of utter surrender. And say, God, not my will, not my will, but yours. I've got my plans, I've got my desires, I've got my ambitions for the future. I've got my, my ideal, my dreams. But I just surrender that to you. I just want to be filled with the knowledge of your will. Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 1 and in verse 11, and he, he prays that they might be filled with the fruits of righteousness. The fruits of righteousness. We thought about that this morning, didn't we? We were thinking about the Lord Jesus. That one that loved righteousness. That one who was righteous. And the desire of Paul is that the believers will be filled with the fruits of righteousness. The evidence of righteousness, the evidence of that righteousness in which we stand before God, accepted in his presence, clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. And that righteousness, the fruit of that, has been seen in our life. You know, we talked this morning about the sincerity of Christ, the integrity of Christ, the purity of Christ. And all oh, that our lives would be marked by these things. In a world where so much is false and so much is just insincere and so much is dishonest. And so much around us is just unclean. It's just downright filthy. And yet Paul prays that we might be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Paul writes to the Ephesians and, and, and he prays that, that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> We've mentioned that before and I've got nothing more to say on that than I've ever said before because I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but these earthen vessels can be filled in the very fullness of an eternal, almighty God. And of course, Paul again says to the Ephesians in chapter 4, he says, you'll be filled. Chapter 5, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk, don't be, don't be filled with wine. But in his rioting, but be filled with the Spirit. And there is all excess and rioting and wrong behavior. That's the, that's the outcome of being filled with wine. That's why we need to turn our back. That's why we need to shun it. That's why we need to say no. Because the potential for riotous living is in drink. We need to shun it. But Paul says, in contrast to that, he says, be filled with the Spirit. And the idea is keep on being filled with the Spirit. And as we are filled with the Spirit, we will live the life that honors God. 
I read a wee quote from Zach Poonan, and he says, it is impossible to live the Christian life as we should without being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It's impossible. We need to be filled with the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. And as we're filled with the Spirit, then the fruits of the Spirit, which is the life of Jesus, is seen as manifest in our lives. But, you know, we notice in the verse that we read, in a couple of verses we read at the end of chapter 3, where Paul talks about our changed, reformed. He says, as we look into the mirror, the mirror of God's word, as we gaze upon the, the glory of the Lord as revealed in his word, he says, we are changed, we are, we are transformed, we are metamorphosized into the same image. And as we read the word, as we meditate on it, as we are we as we are, are, are fixed and focused and absorbed with Christ, then the Holy Spirit will transform us into his very image. So the work of the Spirit of God. And so he forms us. We who were once dead in darkness and a distance and depraved, sinful, shameful, and yet he takes us and he reforms us, he regenerates us, he refashions us, and he places his spirit, the spirit of his son within us. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we'll just read the first four verses of the chapter. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all, that is, the disciples, 120 of them, were all together with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The institution of the church. An amazing moment when the Holy Spirit filled, filled the room where the Christians, the disciples were gathered. What's God doing here? He's forming something. What's he using? The best of materials? I wouldn't have thought Peter was the best of materials. I wouldn't have really have thought any of the disciples were the best of materials. These were the guys that had just run away and left him in his, in his hour in it. These were the guys that had sat in his presence for three and a half years and never got the hardly grasped the word they said. These were guys that were fighting over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom and who was going to sit next to him on the throne. These were a bunch of guys and women, just like me and just like you. And yet the Lord miraculously, providentially, sovereignly just brings them all together. And he forms them into one band. They're of one accord. They're all there for the one purpose. They're all there waiting. Waiting on God to move. They've all been gathered by the Spirit of God. And they're just about to be filled with the Spirit of God. You know, you think of the diversity. You know, Simon of Zelotes, Simon the Zealot was there. And Matthew the tax collector. How did they get on together? 
Matthew was in league with the Romans. And Simon the Zealot would have slit the throats of the Romans. He was a member of a terrorist organization that was trying to drive the Romans out of the land. And here's Matthew, and he's earning a crust of them and living a good lifestyle of them. And yet God brings them together and they're here at the institution of the church. Is that not amazing? You'll bring Jew and Gentile together. You'll bring rich and poor together. You'll bring educated and uneducated. You'll bring a fiery man like Peter. Maybe some of the more contemplative individuals, like Mary. You know, right away at the beginning, you know, just after the birth, it talks about Mary just pondering all these things in her heart. The quiet, contemplative type. And then you'll get fiery Peter. And they're all fought together. And that's what, the, that's, what, that's what the Lord still does, doesn't he? You know, there's no stereotype Christian. We would maybe like them all to be stereotyped. You know, we get a wee bit kind of uptight if, if somebody that a wee bit different that sort of comes into the hall. And it kind of puts us in edge a wee bit and how are we going to handle this individual that doesn't fit the mold? That is pulls apart from, from what we think is the norm. And yet the Lord brought together all, the, all this diversity of characters and they're all together in the upper room. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And that made all the difference. That's what meant that all the differences and the diversity was all overcome by unity, a oneness in the Spirit of God. The institution of the church. What is the church? Well, the church is really the dwelling place of God. The place where God dwells. It doesn't dwell in, in temples made by hands, as it were, but he, he dwells in the midst of his people. It's interesting, you know, you go way back to the book of Exodus and you know, we, 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 learn about the, we learn about the tabernacle, which was the dwelling place of God. And we learn about how God formed it. Then in Exodus 40 and verse 35, we learn how God filled it. And until, until God filled it, it was just an empty tent. Just an empty tent. You know, the tabernacle, I know oftentimes when we think of the tabernacle, we think of all the, the structure, we think of the, the white linen uh, fence, and we, we, we think of the gate, and, and we think of the, the brazen altar and the labor and so on, uh, and the courtyard. But really the tabernacle, strictly speaking, the tabernacle is the tent. We comprise the holy place and the holiest of all, the tent of meeting. The place where God met with his people, a place that was filled with his glory. You know, the interesting thing was it was made up of 40 odd boards. And these boards would just represent you and would represent me. Because these boards were fastened and fixed and formed together as the structure. in which God would dwell. Each of these boards, you know, they had a, they had a previous life. There were acacia trees or shittim trees. They were growing there in the desert sand. They were drawing their life from the, from the, from the, from the water beneath the surface of the soil. There came a point when they were cut down because God had need of them. God had need of them that they might be part of a dwelling house for him. 
That's what he's done with us, isn't it? We've all had a former life. And we owed our existence and we drew our life from, from that which was earthly and sensual and carnal and material and tangible. But God had need of us. That we might become part of his dwelling place. Enough. And so he cut us down. He severed the links with earth. that we may become part of his dwelling place. You know, really, as far as the dwelling place of God is concerned, we'll discover that there was really nothing of, nothing of earth was seen in it. All that radiated within and without was the glory of God. Because these boards were not only cut down and severed from earth, but they were stripped. And then they were overlaid with gold. We talked already, you know, individual believers, there needs to be that sanctification process, that constant working of God in our hearts, forming and fashioning us. We see that in the boards. All the rough edges, they're all stripped away. They're all cut down to the right size. You know, God works in all our lives like that. That's painful. The chopping down, the bringing low. You know, nobody really, nobody, nobody, nobody's ever saved until they're brought low. Calm reminded us of that in the, the four uh, little prayers that, that, that we find in the Gospels. Lord, save me. Lord, remember me. Lord, help me. God, be merciful to me. Their cries of desperation, their cries from the hearts of those that have been brought low. Those that see their need, those that see their emptiness, those that see their desperate peril. Those that are stripped of all self-sufficiency and all pride and they're brought low. It's sad, isn't it, when God brings us low and salvation, and God strips us of our pride and our self-sufficiency, and then we become part of the church, and all that pride just rises again, and all that self-sufficiency. And God's got to deal with it again, 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 again. Someone said the piercing truth, the piercing sword of God's truth must penetrate our souls, bringing us down before we can be raised up, converted men men and women in Christ. But praise God, there's not only the cutting down and there's not the stripping off, but you know, there's the overlaying of the gold. The natural beauty of that wood was hidden by a new beauty, a new glory. The glory, the, 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 the material gold that spoke of the glory of the infinite. God. What does Paul say to the Corinthians in chapter 15? He says, you know, he says, as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall bear and presently bear the image of the heavenly man. The heavenly man. We were once just acacia trees in the desert. But we've been cut down, we've been stripped off, and we've been overlaid with gold. We no longer bear the image of the earthly. No longer bear the image of Adam. But we bear the image of the heavenly man, the glorious Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And these boards were all fastened together. And then you've got the various coverings that were placed before them. And you've got the veil that separated the holy from the holiest of all. And then you've got the door that was placed there. And all, all, all just speaks of Christ. But, you know, it was, all a, it was all an empty tent until there came that moment when the glory of God filled the house of God. What a moment that was for Israel. An unmistakable, unforgettable moment. 
when the glory of God came down. You know, it's sad you go through over a few books and you come to 1 Samuel. And we notice that things have deteriorated in Israel. The tabernacle's still there. And the priesthood's still functioning. And the sacrifices are still being made. But, you know, the hearts of the priests and the hearts of the people are far from God. And there's a battle with the Philistines and the ark of God is taken. And one of the daughter-in-laws of the high priest, she gives birth to a child and she calls his name Ichabod. Ichabod simply means the glory of God is departed. It was just back to where it started. An empty tent. An empty tent. That's sad, isn't it? The priest would begin up early in the morning to go through all his rituals and kill all the sacrifices and present them and go into the holy and trim the lamps <coughs> and change the showbread. But its very purpose, its very reason for existence was no longer there. The glory of God had departed. That was Lady Sia. Lady Sia as a church in that city was still functioning. It would still have its elders and its deacons and its preachers and they would still break bread. They would still teach the word and they would still they would still uh, reach out with the gospel. But the glory of God had departed. The Lord Jesus was outside. Whether he'd been pushed out or cast out or voted out, I don't know. But I know this, he was outside. He was outside. What a challenge. Was it just a gradual, just kind of sliding out the door? Just wee bit by bit? Just men taking over the role that Christ alone should fulfill? Just the bringing in of that that displaced him? until the whole thing was just going on. But the glory of the Lord and the person of the Lord was all it was out. It was just an empty tent. Is there another possibility that churches like that, churches could be like that today? Just that pushing out of Christ. Think of the inauguration of the temple. You've got the tabernacle, and then you've got the temple. It's the same idea. It's the dwelling place of God. It was a magnificent building. Some of us saw slides and saw a model a number of years ago. And our brother Jack, Robert Jack from Argentine was here, and he gave us a week's ministry, or two or three days ministry in the, in the temple. Awesome place. The, the, the amount of, of gold and precious stones and just the, just incredible. But, you know, it was just an empty building <laughs> until Second Chronicles chapter 7 and the glory of God fell <laughs> and filled the place. And that's what made the difference. You know, and the people and the priests we're no longer taken up with the gold and the silver and the cedar and the stones and the architecture. They're just overcome with the awesome sense of the presence of God. You know, the tragedy is you just go on in your Old Testament and you'll discover it eventually just became a heap of stones. It just became a heap of stones. Because the people just got caught up with themselves and they get caught up with the, the gods that were round about them and, and 
They were marked by rebellion, disobedience, and idolatry and sin and immorality. And God took them away. And the whole place just was reduced to a heap of rubble. What a challenge. Do you ever learn the lessons of history? Do you ever learn the lessons of the Old Testament? You think, oh, that can't happen to us, you know. Yeah, it can. Or that we might just recover something of a sense of the awesome presence of God. Because everything's vain and empty. If he's not here. I was just reading that verse in 1 Corinthians 14 this morning. It talks about the unbeliever, the unlearned, coming into the company of believers at Corinth. And the secrets of his heart, were made, his heart was made manifest. And falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Is that not what we long for? They never trouble you. You think of people that come and go and come and go and come and go over the years. And the fact that we come and go week by week. And our hearts just seem to be so hard and the hearts of the unbelievers seem to be so hard. And, 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 and you know, we just listen to truth and, and it doesn't affect us and there doesn't seem to be that exposure of our sin and confession and that acknowledgement. God is in us. God is here. Oh, that God in his mercy would visit us afresh. That God would come down. And that God would presence himself among us in a real and a mighty, mighty way. You see, everything deteriorates. Whether it was under the tabernacle system or the temple system, or whether it was in the church in the New Testament, everything just deteriorates from that, that virgin purity and glory. Remember what? Remember the words of the Lord to Ephesus. You know, He says, "I'll, I'll just, I'll just remove the candles then. I'll just become a, I'll just become a heap of ruins. There'll be nothing there for me. You don't need to, you don't need to read too far into the Acts of the Apostles when you see the deterioration, and you see deceit in the church." And you see division in the church. And you go through and you'll see immorality, you'll see idolatry. And the whole thing just deteriorates. Oh, that we may come before the Lord with confession of sin. And that longing that God would come down again. And that God would restore us and revive us and fill us with a sense of his presence and glory. Finally, just a couple of minutes. Ezekiel chapter 37. The restoration of Israel. I don't have time to read the verses, really. We all know it. It's the valley of dry bones. Very dry and very many. It's a picture of Israel. It's a picture of that day when Israel is going to be restored and revived. But what does God do? He, 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 he fashions and he forms and then he fills. <laughs> and he brings these bones together and he forms them into human skeletons and he puts the muscle and the sinew and then he'll put the skin on them. Well, there's something else needed. The breath of God, the work of the Spirit, to make them alive. This is the future for Israel. Be seized Israel. 
coming a day when there's going to be a gathering back to the land. Well, I know they were gathered back in 1948 or whatever, but they're there in unbelief. Israel is a secular nation with a secular government, a secular prime minister and president. It's coming a day. Yeah, they're going to be besieged. <laughs> they're the besiegers at the moment. They're the guys on the offensive. But there's coming a day when they'll very much be on the defensive. <laughs> and that nation will almost be obliterated. Dry bones, dead bones, very many. And God will move. God will move. You bring them all together. Scattered right now through all the countries of the earth, and you'll bring them all together. And you'll breathe on them afresh. And the nation that is at the tail of the nations will become at the head of all nations. And the king that they rejected 2,000 years ago will sit on his throne in the very city where he was falsely accused and he was spat on and he was crucified. He'll sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And through that nation, he will reign over all the earth. There is a glorious day of restoration and revival for the nation of Israel. Don't read too much into what's happening just now. Don't need too much in yet. I know, you know, pulpits have been resounding over the world with people making prophecies or trying to see the fulfillment of prophecies and what's been happening. Now, I think we've got to be aware of what's happening, but don't read too much in it and say, well, this is a fulfillment of this or that or the next thing. Listen, God's got his own calendar and God will work it out. Right now, Israel is in unbelief. Israel is under divine government. Until that day when the Lord will move afresh, gather together, that there may be his people in his land, acknowledging his lordship over every area of their lives. So there's the principle. From Genesis right through to Revelation, you get the, the, the manifestation of the Lord Jesus in power to set up that king, his kingdom, the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. And right through the whole of Scripture, God does something. He, he takes the, he takes not the best of the materials, but the worst kind of materials, and he fashions them, and he forms it, and then he fills it. Whether it's creation, whether it's the Scriptures, whether it's it's the it's the formation of man, uh, whether it's the incarnation of Christ, he takes a he takes just a, a poor peasant girl who's not even married, and and into her womb he 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 he, he from her womb she, he brings forth the Messiah, uh, having the Holy Spirit having come upon her and conceived that which was in her womb, and and he does it with a regeneration of believers, the sanctification of the believers, the institution of the church and the restoration of Israel. He does exactly the same thing. He fashions, he forms, and then he and then he fills. And right through it all, there is the work, there's the ministry, there's the power, there's the person of the Spirit of God. Let's be praying.